I had got accused of killing and beheading a dog. I did behead him, I didn't kill him. He was my friend, his name was Shadow. And uh, he got hit by a car and they brought his corpse to me and they asked me to get his skull, so I did. But the owner, the girlfriend. She's just saying this casually, like this is just, oh yeah, like yeah, you just got, I just got his corpse and then yeah, like, you know what I'm saying? Like very, very, very sick behavior. I'm not going with you, bro. <laughs> Furry Freaks, the internet's most notorious furries. Mari, this what one's for you. Mari, this one is for you. If you a furry, I just don't respect you. I just don't respect you if you're a furry. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm definitely uh, a freak, not that type, though. Damn. Notorious subcult. One of the most notorious subcultures on the internet is that of the furry community. Furries have been around for decades, their bizarre activities, artwork, and conventions being a source of comedy, bewilderment, and disgust for millions of online gawkers. And while most involved in the furry community are simply fun seekers with a shared interest in animal alter egos, I'm immediately clicking. does have a dark side. From furries committing bestiality, to revenge killings, to life-threatening gas attacks, these are the what world's the most dangerous furries. Our first story involves a bioterrorism attack that occurred at a furry convention back in 2014. When furries were awoken from their sleep by a foul odor that was permeating the convention center hotel, police were notified and a criminal investigation soon followed. This is the story of the Furfest gas attack. To begin this story, let's go back to December 5th of 2014. The location, Rosemont, Illinois. The venue, Hyatt Regency Hotel near O'Hare Airport. What was likely one of the largest gatherings of furries in United States history, Furfest 14 could be described as a religious experience for those in the furry fandom. Religious the venue was crazy. flush with plush, with each patron donning their custom-made fur suits and commiserating flush with plush with each page yo that is what the f that is definitely mordecai what the f i was looking at uh terrence right here patron donning their custom made fursuits and commiserating with their cartoonish companions the furries listened to panels, bought and sold art, and met friends that they had been communicating with online for years. This is a big deal for a lot of furries out there. The fun would go on for nearly three days, but unfortunately, on the final day of Midwest Fur Fest 2014, a criminal element would enter the picture that threatened the entire convention. It was the early morning hours of December 7th, the final day of Fur Fest. Most furries were tucked in bed by this point, with only a few lone wolves awake still burning the midnight oil. One furry is returning to their hotel room on the ninth floor after going out for a smoke. Oh, but after Lord. stepping out of the ninth floor elevator, they're almost immediately hit in the face with a pungent odor that causes their nose to burn and their eyes to water and steam. And other furries that were sleeping would be awakened by this sudden atmospheric disturbance. Moments later, hotel alarms began sounding and the confused furries now began to panic. As a result of this mysterious miasma, the entire building was- Yo, imagine seeing that, like you're, imagine just being a random firefighter and you see a whole bunch of people evacuate a hotel and you just see a whole, like, bunch of people in fursuits just walk out. Like, y'all know y'all could take that off at some point. Y'all don't gotta be wearing that, like, 24-7. It can come off at some point, you know what I'm saying? But let's see what's happening now. Now began to panic. As a result of this mysterious miasma, the entire building was being evacuated. This is a quote taken by a Furfest attendee regarding the smell. Quote, it smelled for all the world like the worst pool shock you've ever been around. Like it was eye stingingly bad outside of the hotel. As attendees exited the convention center hotel, they found that police and news reporters were already on the scene. The situation turned out to be a matter of national attention and was being treated as an active bioterrorist attack. Many furries that had been evacuated were being treated for exposure to the unidentified vapor. Most were lucky, only experiencing minor irritation. Never mind. 
to the eyes, but others weren't so fortunate. In fact, a total of 19 FurFest attendees were sent to the hospital due to health complications related to this Damn. apparent gas attack. That's crazy. Once all the furries had been herded from the hotel, police would storm the building looking for the source. Whoever did it, I ain't gonna lie, whoever did it needs to be brought to justice immediately because that's that's an insane tactic to do to somebody. Like that has a lot of planning to go into it if you if you really like if you really think about it, a gas attack of this noxious odor and after performing a cursory search they would find that source it was a glass bottle that had been filled with poisonous chlorine powder someone had intentionally shattered this chlorine container just outside of the ninth floor stairway exit causing dangerous chlorine gas to fill various areas of the hotel first responders reported that the average gas measured resulted in 1.4 parts per million According to the National Library of Medicine, one to three parts per million results in mild mucous membrane irritation that can usually be tolerated for about an hour. However, it's thought that the chlorine concentration could have been even higher in areas closer to the chlorine source on the ninth floor. Law enforcement considered this act intentional and would open a criminal investigation into the matter and started searching for potential suspects. Meanwhile, during the chaos, the evacuated furries came together and supported each other in this time of stress. One furry attendee even reportedly went to a nearby McDonald's and got McMuffins for the evacuated furries. W... <sighs> I never thought I'd say this. W... <sighs> Y'all know what I'm trying to say. Um, but yeah, whoever did that, they, they really like, I don't know. You gotta find out who did that. When the going got tough, the herd of furries came together. At approximately 4.30 a.m., chlorine levels would reach zero and guests were permitted to return to their hotel rooms. With things returning to normal, the last day of Fur Fest would actually be permitted to occur and it went on without a hitch. If the Fur Fest terrorist intention was to ruin the final day of the event, they failed miserably. And in regard to the furries that needed medical attention, thankfully 18 of the 19 that were sent to the hospital had been released the next day. In regard to Furfest, all went well for the most part. The only confounding variable to this story though is the mysterious identity of the perpetrator. The yeah, identity of the Furfest gas attacker is still unknown to this day. Even after a thorough law enforcement investigation, the chlorine contaminator was never found. With police not being able to identify the culprit, this has naturally led to a lot of speculation online in regard to the matter. With there suit. being many theories floating around postulating whoever did it must have hated, like, hated furries, like, with a passion. Like, a furry must have, like, slayed the entire clan or something. Because that's the only thing that makes sense who could have done it. Many have pointed to a handful of prominent trolls within the furry community as being likely responsible for the gas attack. Hobby. Their prime suspect, who I'll keep nameless, had allegedly brought a firearm to a prior furry convention. This motherfucker got an old Driscoll mouse tool. He has a flint lock, bro. Like what? This, this motherfucker has a, a, a Fortnite legendary item. What, what, what is, what is that? And some community members have alleged that this man once claimed responsibility for the attack itself. But even if that's true, these are only circumstantial leads. No real direct evidence has ever surfaced connecting this person to the biohazard contamination. And in all reality, it's very likely that any troll claiming responsibility for the crime had nothing to do with it, and they're likely just trying to bait reactions from the furry community members. Whatever the case, the Furfest gas attacker is still at large, and only time will tell if this mysterious individual faces justice for their crime. Y'all think he's ever gonna get caught? I forgot when he said it was, but y'all feel like they ever gonna... I don't think they ever gonna catch him. To be honest, if I'm keeping it stacked, the police probably forgot about it because nobody passed away as a result. So police probably forgot about it. And then like, uh, he probably never getting caught. Bro, that probably mad is that it didn't end up canceling the event though. You know what I'm saying? That's, it's tough. They probably closed. Yeah, they definitely, they definitely do not care. They definitely do not care. Zell the Wolf, oh man. Our next story involves a- No, 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 no. <laughs> No, 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 I don't like where this is going. No, I don't, I do not, do not like where this is going. No, no.
depraved member of the furry community using deviant art to lure in a 12-year-old victim. Oh this story God. begins with 21-year-old Mesa, Arizona man Aaron Usury. Usury could be described as an internet-addicted loner and spent most of his days in front of a computer. Loser. A self-described artist and furry community member, Aaron was a regular visitor of a variety of furry fandom forums, but his favorite website... Furry fandom forums. Yo, could y'all imagine... Five Nights at Freddy's must have been like... Five Nights at Freddy's must have been like... I don't know. The second coming of Christ for these furries. Or something, bro. I don't know. To, to them, it must have been like that. Just based on what I'm seeing right now site in particular was none other than DeviantArt.com. Under his furry pseudonym, Zell the Wolf, Aaron posted to the site frequently, sharing his furry artwork to the message board on a regular basis. Aaron's artwork was crude, derivative, and oftentimes contained sexual themes, with many of his drawings portraying his Zell character romantically involved with other DeviantArt furries. One image in particular shows Zell cuddled next to a wolf-like character that he had just bitten on the neck. The 21-year-old furry also created poems that bordered on melodrama, these poems indicating that the man had some sort of inner turmoil that he was going through. Time will tell. Where do I go when I just want to be okay? What do I do when nothing seems to go my way? I will sit here and wait. Waiting for... Dot, 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 dot. <laughs> no. <laughs> Weird. Brother, this guy stinks! Which of course brings us to some of the more questionable friendships that Aaron, aka Zell the Wolf, would make using DeviantArt. In some point in September of 2014, Zell the Wolf found himself becoming considerably close with two 12-year-old girls that he met on the DeviantArt website. And that's already weird. That, that, that in by itself is already weird. Right. These two minors were from Kansas and frequently spoke to Aaron online, thinking highly of the man for his artwork. Initially bonding through their shared interest in furry fandom, the relationship would expand over time. The next chat evolves to voice and video, with Aaron conversing back and forth with the 12-year-old girls using Skype and Google Hangouts. Google it said Hangout. that in these calls, Aaron would attempt to counsel the young girls regarding their issues with school, bullying, parents, and depression things that Aaron claimed he dealt with growing up. But let's be honest, guys. I don't think it takes much of a rocket scientist to tell where this story was going. Zell the Wolf was grooming these 12-year-old girls. During the later stages of Aaron's interactions with the 12-year-olds, he would begin chatting explicitly, sending and receiving nude photos with the minors on a regular basis. And so weird, bro. So weird. This is, I don't know, bro. I, I'm, I'm not trying to generalize the group of furries, but like, I don't know, like, be weird, like, I don't know, and then blame it on some other stuff that really just doesn't matter in this situation. And if that wasn't sickening enough, it's been reported that at one point, Aaron would send a video of himself having sex with the family dog to the... Yeah, give him life. Give him life. Give him life. Give him life. I already knew what type of video we were getting into. Yeah, I, I hope I hope the absolute worst for him. I'm not gonna lie, Twitch. Twitch, this is an educational video. We are not co-signing anything that is going on in this video. I hope the worst for this dude. I'm not gonna lie. The twelve-year-olds. Yeah, the man filmed himself committing bestiality and sent it to minors. This horrific arrangement would go on for months until an adult would finally get involved. In February of 2015, the disgusting relationship was terminated after one of the 12-year-old's mothers discovered the repugnant chat logs and videos. The mother would contact the police and a criminal investigation was open against Aaron Usury. On April 11th of 2015, Aaron's home was raided and the police would discover messages between him and the two kids and CP was present on the man's electronic devices. Aaron Usury would be taken to jail with the bond set at $25,000. What a he had bond at all two, he had two two different like you know what i'm saying jits how the hell did he get bond at all sometime later aaron usury aka zell the wolf was found guilty on charges ranging from bestiality to luring a minor for sexual exploitation the man was convicted to serve 17 years in prison with 17 no possibility of parole since being in car 17 days 
<laughs> Y'all be saying I be going too harsh. They should have gave bro life. That like dead serious. They should have gave him life. They should have gave bro life at the bare minimum. They should have gave him life. If y'all can hear the, the what he did and plus the dog, they should have gave bro life. I'm not going to hold you. Like, incarcerated, a news crew has performed a jailhouse interview with lawyer the lawyer. Saul this like, is his side of it. They should have given him life. And I was able to help one of them through her cutting and suicide issues. Shut the. Who this body of this body? For a long time, I was making progress, and then over time, it became more about me and less about them and that's when I lost everything that I stood for. Everyone seems to just take into a, take into their own minds that it's not possible. You can't be in love with someone. Well, you can. Let them know, hey, I know that you're on the internet a lot. I know that this is really exciting for you, but but be mindful that there are things out there that you will want to avoid and hear what some of those things are. You! 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 I'm about to piss me off, bro. Here's why we want you to avoid them. Despite his apologetic demeanor, I think the furry community and the public in general will be happy to know that this man is behind bars for over 10 more years. That just pissed me off. An online community that's closely related to the furries is that of the Wolfkin. Rather than roleplay under furry alter egos, members of the Wolfkin community believe themselves to actually be part wolf. And these Wolfkin individuals form packs with other Wolfkin in their communities and also uh, participate in these bizarre rituals to boot. <laughs> Y'all know that one meme of that dog where it says, why can't you just be normal? That's all I'm thinking of right now. Arguably the most infamous Wolfkin community member in internet history is Wolfie Blackheart. This teen werewolf rose to infamy after the internet discovered she had allegedly decapitated a dog and boiled down its head. Believing the girl to be a degenerate dog killer, 4chan would launch a campaign to get the girl locked up. This is the story of Wolfie Blackheart. Our story begins in early 2010 in San Antonio, Texas. Around this time, a group of teenagers and young adults involved in the Wolfkin subculture had banded together to form the... I'm, I'm speechless. I'm not Crimson lie. Blood Wolf Pack. This I'm wolf let it play pack out. served as a friend group with a twist. I mean, it, it's really more than a friend group. These people considered themselves family, a clan of wolves. And as with any pack of wolves, there has to be an alpha dog, and the alpha dog of the Crimson Blood Wolf Pack was a girl named Wolfie Blackheart. Very much immersed into lichen mythology, old social media photos from the time allow a glimpse into Wolfie's interests. One finds a bounty of photos taken of Wolfie featuring dogs, a room lined with animal skulls that she apparently taxidermied herself. This is not regular behavior that should be supported. And the funny thing about y'all, a lot of y'all in this, like, just have this mentality. Well, if you're not hurting nobody, then, I mean, you should just leave them alone. No. Stop that mentality right there. There are signs, and this is this is this is a sign. And an overall gothic-inspired aesthetic forming the bedrock of Wolfie's identity. Wolfie also claims to have an allergy to silver, which is known in werewolf lore to be a toxic metal that kills them. Like a lot of people would say, oh, you're allergic to silver. I personally am allergic to silver and nickel, but not all werewolves are. Like it's an individualistic thing. Like someone can be allergic to flowers, you know. And Wolfie's job heyday back in 2010 there was a bit of a local obsession with the girl the girl was not only charismatic but she had a mischievous streak about her adding to the mystique that would come to make wolfie an enigmatic figure among san antonio wolfkin she was also once arrested on a burglary charge and she has uh, a berserk weapon crafted probably from from bones decayed bones or something bro. i don't know i was proved not guilty because i didn't do it i was in the woods nearby which i'm always in the woods and uh, they caught me and my friend in the woods. We didn't do the break-in. But in Jan- Parents, by the way, parents, where y'all at? Yo, parents. Yo, parent. I'm dead blaming the parents for this. Like, dude, I, all y'all had to be like, is they can't go out. 
Just that's literally all you have to say. And make sure that doesn't happen. I'm blaming the parents for this. I'm not gonna hold you. January of 2010, a shocking development would surface that suggested that perhaps Wolfie wasn't this innocuous Wolfkin influencer that most people thought she was. Late in the month, a photo would surface on 4chan showing an outstretched arm holding a decapitated dog's head. The photo immediately cultured outrage on the boards and prompted swift investigation into the origin and circumstances that led up to what was shown in the photo. Those familiar with the deep lore of 4chan know just how seriously the community takes animals. GTA, and GTA. The case of this dog head would be no exception. Members of 4chan created an IRC chat room dedicated to solving the alleged crime. In this IRC, many leads were discovered, and using EXIF image data and a deep dive on MySpace, 4chan users managed to trace the potential source of the photo to Wolfie Blackheart and a handful of friends associated with the Crimson Blood Wolf Pack. Names and phone numbers were eventually discovered, and this resulted in the 4chan community firing off a shotgun blast of calls and texts to these numbers in an attempt to get a confession for this apparent dog decapitation. This would prompt an anonymous... He's saying a parent. He's saying a parent. So let's let's see what it really is. Associate of Wolfie to come forward and give an explanation. And this individual went by the name Razor or Raz. Razor would pop into the IRC chat and comment the following. Everyone shut up for a set. Sec. Raz. Okay, I R Raz. No one killed the fucking dog. A truck running through my neighborhood ran him over. I tried to save him, but he died on the way to the vet. I'm the dog's caretaker, he was astray, I took him in, I hate my friends for defiling the body, they beheaded it. Dog died in a car accident, they just messed with the body. That's just as bad. That's, that's, that's just as terrible. That's, that's, that's not any better actually, you know what I'm saying? Like, not better, bro, bro said like, hey, relax guys, it's not like, 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 relax guys, you know what I'm saying? I hate my friends for doing this, but I just want to set the record straight. A purported subsequent phone call with Raz would reveal more information about the situation. Apparently, Raz claimed that the dog in question was allegedly a stray one of Wolfie's friends had picked up and had been caring for. The dog was given the name Shadow, and as mentioned in the IRC log, the cause of Shadow's death was supposedly due to him escaping his enclosure and getting hit by a vehicle. In this purported phone call, it's also alleged that Shadow was then given to some friends, unnamed in the call, to prepare for burial when it was reportedly later decided that the head would be preserved as a keepsake. And why would you give it to your friends for any reason? Yo, this is disgusting. This is uh, this is actually like disgusting. I'm not gonna lose you. And it goes without saying, considering Wolfie's penchant for animal skulls, the head was then given to her to prepare for taxidermy. Seeing this as a tangible lead for real law enforcement, 4chan dug up Raz's real name and handed it and their speculations along with the IRC chat logs to San Antonio authorities w and the local media. But things start getting even weirder at this point of the story because around this time, a woman named Kathy Silva, who was a nearby resident of Wolfie, she would come forward claiming that Shadow was in fact one point her dog in this dog's name was Rigsby and one day Rigsby just mysteriously disappeared from her backyard. This has led many to speculate that the dog was perhaps stolen by one of Wolfie's friends. This is getting this is getting worse. Yo, this is actually I'm thinking like it cannot get any worse, but it's actually getting bad. So bro was capping. According to this woman, this, this is a kidnapped dog in GTA that they and the dog okay. but this remains unproven it's very well possible that if rigsby really was kathy silva's pet he could have just simply escaped from her premises and was mistaken as a stray by the gang then taken in by wolfie's friends regardless in the following days police would do a bit of snooping around and discovered that wolfie blackheart was in the possession of several animal skulls and they also heard that she may have been given the body of shadow Naturally, a search warrant was issued for Wolfie Blackheart's home. Police arrived and initiated a search. Police online have accused her of beheading a dog. I didn't kill any animal. I wouldn't. Like, like I said, I'd be more likely to hurt a human than a dog any day. And even then, very, very, like, not really possible. I'm pretty friendly. But I didn't get him as Rigsby. My friend brought him as her dog, who got hit by a car named Shadow. 
And was he alive at the time? Dead. Dead. He was kind of stiff. Wolfie claims she's done nothing illegal. She says there's a group of people harassing her. They've even hacked into her personal accounts online. Now you have to ask yourself, was Wolfie going to be getting in any trouble for this? If the police could determine that the gang killed the dog just for the sake of taxidermying its head, Absolutely. Right to jail, right away. But if the story about the dog getting hit by a car and the owner simply wanted Wolfie to preserve the skull, that's a little bit of a different situation, you know what I mean? Wolfie has gone on record several times telling her side of the story, claiming that she did indeed decapitate the dog's head, but only did so after it was dead as to taxidermy Shadow's skull for the current owner, who was apparently a fellow. Which is not any better. Like, this is, this, they. Everybody involved in this situation is actually sick. It's like very, very, like very sick. Hello, Wolfkin as a spiritual keepsake. I had got accused of killing and beheading a dog. I did behead him, I didn't kill him. He was my friend, his name was Shadow. And uh, he got hit by a car and they brought his corpse to me and they asked me to get his skull, so I did. But the owner's girlfriend. She's just saying this casually, like this is just, oh yeah, like yeah, you just got, I just got his corpse and then yeah, like, you know what I'm saying? Like very, very, very sick behavior. I'm not going with you, bro. And I, I don't know, bro. This is this is crazy. People really say now there's a lot of sick people, but in the, the late 2000s, uh, early, uh, early 2010s you see a lot of these people that look like they came out of the lemonade mouth movie bro like they was like i don't know bro took a picture of him and uh, they put it online and that's what caused all the fuss regardless at the time of the raid no animal abuse charges were being what about filed job, by the state against other? Wolfie, but the investigation was still ongoing the whole debacle was quite the controversy and much conversation swirled online regarding it. Many believe that even if Wolfie's story was true, what she did was still reprehensible, while others thought what she did was honorable and respected. Wolfie is innocent and not a freak. <laughs> Look at the profile picture. Look at the profile picture, bro. Look at the profile pictures that's saying that. That her she did was still reprehensible, while others thought what she did was honorable and respected her choice. Despite all the public outcry, I there was no this, solid bro. evidence collected during the police search that suggested that Wolfie Blackheart had intentionally killed a dog. It appeared authorities believed the story about Shadow being killed by a car on the road. Additionally, there was nothing to suggest that the decapitation of the dog was an act committed out of malice. While indeed disturbing and outside of the realm of anything you or I would do, the taxidermy of Shadow's skull was only done for preservation purposes, a bizarre wolfkin ritual to keep the dog close in spirit to their wolfkin owner. With all this in mind, it was ultimately decided by the state to not press charges and the investigation into Wolfie Blackheart would cease. In the wake of the controversy, Wolfie would begin to slink away from Back the public on. eye, but she wouldn't be forgotten. As after all the national attention, she became a living legend amongst Wolfkin nationwide. A living legend. Y'all Wolfkin motherfuckers are odd, bro. I... A cursory search on YouTube will yield dozens of tribute videos created by individuals participating in the subculture. These videos often take the form of made on PowerPoint. Did y'all see it? Yeah, like that was really made. This is made on PowerPoint, bro. Slide shows featuring photos of Wolfie. The comment section full of fa Thank you, Wolfie. You inspired me to be to not be what you are. I want to be a part of the pack now. Wolfie is awesome and amazing. I love you. Fans idolizing her. And while there's many out there that look up to Wolfie, there's an equal and opposite w group first person. that feel as if a great injustice was served in regard to this controversy. Refusing to believe Wolfie's side of the story, some to this day accuse her of being a dog killer. Many point to the allegations that Shadow was stolen from its previous owner. After all, if that was the case, the implication of the taxidermy become far more questionable if the original owner was actively looking for their lost or stolen dog. Whatever the case, this strange story does have one sort of positive takeaway is that 4chan and the internet in general are always going to turn over every stone when it comes to these potential animal abuse cases. Gee, that was crazy, bro. The furry triple. When two yeah. furry community members are forbidden. That one was actually insane, bro. I said all I need to say about that, but chat, there are really like, I say, this is why I say the internet 
is such a weird, odd place, bro. It's so it's so strange. It's always been. It's always going to be. Hidden from talking to a 17-year-old girl, the man such a had a zone. dastardly plot to reestablish contact with the minor, a plot that quickly turns deadly. This is the story of the furry triple murder. Our story begins with the Yost family from Fullerton, California. The Yost family consisted of mother Jennifer, stepfather Christopher, and their three daughters, the oldest 17-year-old Caitlin pictured here. The Yost were a happy family and active members of the furry community. 17-year-old Caitlin took her involvement in the furry fandom quite seriously and even had her own fursona known as Daydreamer Foxwolf. Persona? She used this Foxwolf fursona online and at IRL furry gatherings. The Yoss would often participate in family-oriented furry activities, such as fur bowling events and a variety of furry conventions. And it would be within the furry fandom that Caitlin Yoss would meet two individuals important to the narrative of this story, 25-year-old Frank Enti Felix and his friend, 21-year-old Josh Acosta. Both of these men were linked to the community, with Frank Felix reportedly being a regular attendee of furry cons. While the exact circumstances of how the three met are unclear, Frank, Josh, and Caitlin would form a friendship. Frank in particular got close to the 17-year-old, so much so that furry community members often and suggested that something inappropriate may have been going on behind the scenes. The thought being that perhaps Caitlyn was being groomed by these older men. Caitlyn's in right, so for the two older dudes, where do y'all work at? Where, where do y'all, like, is it a Safeway, a Giant, McDonald's, Popeye? I just gotta know, like, what the employment's looking like. I gotta know what goes on the 1090 tax return, bro. I gotta know... I gotta know where the income coming in. I just have to know. I'm just so curious. I'm just so curious. Like, that's all That's all I want to know at this point in time. Interaction with these two men would go on for some time. But eventually, the relationship between Felix Acosta and Caitlin would come to a close after Caitlin's mother, Jennifer, seeing how close her daughter had gotten to these grown men, decided to step in, compelling the men to no longer contact the girl. But this wouldn't be the last the family would see of Frank Felix and Josh Acosta, as the two men would make a grisly return to the Yost family in the near future. In the early morning hours oh, of September 24th of 2016, Fullerton, California 911 dispatch receives a phone call from a young girl claiming that an unknown man had broken into her home and killed her mom and dad. If you play the call, you'll know how to skip it. Turns out this caller was the six-year-old daughter of Jennifer and wow. Christopher Yost. Police soon arrived at the family residence only to find the Yost parents dead. Both had been fatally shot point blank while sleeping. Additionally, a visiting family friend named Arthur Boucher had also been killed during this apparent home invasion. Imagine you just visiting and that happens to you, bro. That's crazy. You don't got literally nothing to do with that. And curiously, Caitlin was nowhere to be found. Police would- Okay, so at first, I wasn't gonna say let me let me let me get because I wasn't gonna say nothing because I thought you know what I'm saying the parents had passed away and then Caitlin has too. But let's let let me let me just keep listening real quick. Would open a criminal investigation into the matter and it wouldn't be long until they discovered the controversy that occurred between Caitlin Felix and Acosta. Naturally, the two men would become prime suspects, considering the recent falling out. The two were heavily questioned by authorities and the truth would eventually surface. Frank Felix and Josh Acosta were both linked to the killings, with Felix allegedly escorting Josh to the Yost home in a truck, and Acosta entering the home and killing the family with a shotgun. Why both though? Hit with a slew of homicide charges. Now in regard to the motive behind the killings, you might think it's pretty self-explanatory. The two guys got pissed Pissed off at the family for the parents cutting but even that is a crazy reason to go take some of my life away like you could, you could tell both of them were unemployed like didn't have any money coming in at all like nothing Caitlin off from them but court proceedings would reveal the situation was far more complex during the trial Josh Acosta's defense made a number of disturbing accusations regarding Caitlin and the Yoss family Acosta claimed that the 17 year old girl had convinced Felix and himself to kill her parents oh yeah Oh yeah, I ain't gonna hold you, bet, bet, say that, yeah. Okay, take it out, you can 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 take it out, yeah, take it out, 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 take it out. I wasn't gonna say nothing, cause I ain't know what her involvement was or nothing like that. But what the f***? I'm 
I'm gonna let chat. I'm gonna let chat. I'm gonna let chat say. It. But y'all, y'all know, y'all know what I was thinking. Y'all know, y'all know, y'all know what I was thinking. Accusing the family of multiple forms of child abuse. During the trial, Caitlin herself was granted immunity and would testify, alleging that she had been molested by her stepfather and confided this information in Frank Felix. And according to Caitlin, Felix would use this information as blackmail to sleep with the 17 year old girl. Wow. However, Ew. it appears that the girl no longer cared to preserve her family relationship and decided to run away from home, asking Josh Acosta and Frank Felix with help in doing so. And according to Caitlin, that's when Frank Felix and Josh Acosta come to pick her up so she can run away from home. But I guess, you know, in the moment, one of the men decide the best thing to do is to go in the house and just kill the family to get him out of the picture Jesus to make the Christ, situation bro. easy for them, I guess. Josh Acosta's defense team would not both them, them two. Yeah, I know I'd be saying in life a lot, but. They probably, they, if they don't get like, they need something close to it because they just not all the way there. The takes, first of all, they was, they was furry. So, I mean, that tells you all you need to know. But like, Blue Rye actually, actually stop disrespecting the furry community. No, I know it's not all y'all, but like, come on, bro. They obviously were unemployed. I'm not going to hold you. Blame Caitlyn for the killings saying, quote, I know she is not on trial, but she is the villain. And the finger that pulled the trigger that killed her parents belonged to Katie. The defense would claim that Josh Acosta was autistic and he was unable to tell people's motives and just went along with <sighs> Caitlin's apparent murderous ideas. Needless to say, the jury wasn't satisfied by the autistic defense. Whatever the case, the sexual abuse story was never verified, and even if that was the case, it doesn't justify you killing three people. Joshua Acosta was eventually found guilty of murder and was given three life sentences. <laughs> Now that's what I like to see. Now that's what I like to see. Yeah, yeah, good pack two. Good pack two. Come on, Judge. Talk, talk, talk. That's what I like to see, bro. Three life sentences plus. Uh, bro gave him extra content, extra DLC to deal with. Just in case. Damn. That's what I like to see. See, that, that's a good judge right there. I, I like those out of him, man. Come on plus another 75 years frank felix is still you know i had to triple it awaiting trial for his alleged involvement in the murder in the time following this tragedy furries held memorials for the deceased family and created a gofundme for the two daughters of the yas and boucher's daughter as well the yas children were also taken into the custody of a family member and were given counseling after the traumatic what happened to the to the girl who you know what i'm saying like kind of set her parents up events and what was likely one of the saddest tragedies in furry history Jesus that Christ. was the story of the furry triple murder jesus murders. christ there's another one jesus christ our next story this is the last video for tonight by the way is a disturbing case involving two fursuit makers after the couple's mental health and financial situation enter a downward spiral they soon find themselves accused of some of the most heinous crimes oh, yeah, she got immunity this is the story of the first. All right, I, I'm not gonna hold you. Now, furry, all furry jokes aside, this dude actually looks like he's part werewolf. I'm, I'm like, this man is in desperate need. I know y'all be saying that I need a cup, but he's in desperate need of a lineup, shape up, uh, tent, like anything at this point. Like, trim, shape, he needs something. I ain't gonna lie to you, bro. Pursuit killers. One of the most interesting elements of the furry community is the fursuits. Fursuits can Man's be described as a physical manifestation of a furry's idealized image. The furry character they see themselves as in roleplay online made into a wearable costume that could be worn to gatherings and events. Now unsurprisingly, there's a lot that goes into making a fursuit. While some can be simple in design, the more custom suits require quite a bit of craftsmanship to pull off and admittedly look impressive when well executed. Jesus! Three bands for a full furry suit? You could get a job with that. Bro, you could do a lot. You can invest in that. You can invest in something. Three bands for to buy a furry suit? Poverty job scare? Jesus Christ. Chump change for you? Regardless, okay, all memes aside. Who the fuck is paying three bands for a furry suit, bro? Imagine you've been working, like, you know what I'm saying, nine to five job. You finally get enough money 
to really and that to give three k on three k isn't little money. Like you have to be comfortable enough to give three k. So you just sitting down, just chilling. You know what I'm saying? All good, everything going good. You've been working, and you finally get to three point five k, and then you spend three k, three point uh two k of that on a full furry suit. Bad light choices. I'm renting that. Bad life choices. Yeah, you're gonna rent that. It's gonna smell like bounce that ass in the depression. And it goes without saying that a quality suit can be costly with suits ranging from and you it's know, used? hundreds of dollars to potentially like $10,000 for a well made suit. With you gotta have that like payment that, plan? Yo, payment plan on the furry suit is good. Karna on the uh, furry suit is insane. It's no surprise that some turn to budget options. Bank statement is gonna be looking crazy. Fursuit. Some small time indie fursuit makers are able to offer on, deals Matt. on suits, such as fursuit makers Vex and Jax, real name Jacob T. Berkovitz and Tanya R. Dillard. These two furries were well- Dillard, these do not sound like real people. Well known in the furry fandom and on occasion would make custom fursuits for community members. Under the name Lockjaw Arts, the duo offered their services, making relatively affordable fursuits of decent quality. The two reportedly made dozens of suits in their time as creators. But aside from their fursuit creation, the duo was also known for having a depressive social media presence. The two would frequently use Twitter to open lament about personal struggles. Taking a brief foray through the individual's accounts, one finds many distressing posts regarding the mental health of Vex and Jax and updates regarding suicide attempts apparently made by these people. These personal mental health struggles would often get in the way of the duo finishing their commissions, and eventually their fursuit making business would halt entirely, with the story of Lockjaw Arts suddenly taking a bizarre criminal turn. In March of 2020, Vex and Jax reportedly posted an ad to Craigslist that led the couple coming into contact with Las Vegas man Hector Mendez Hernandez. Reports as to what exactly this ad requested vary, but I've seen claims that it was a dating style ad, but I've also seen reports saying that it was like hailing taxi services. Whatever the case, taxi. at some point during this interaction, Vex and Jax find themselves at Hector Hernandez's home and allegedly murder the guy. According to reports, Hernandez was beaten with fists, a dumbbell, stabbed, and shot. A dumbbell? And yo, like, come on! And then here, and here, here people gonna go. Here people gonna go. Well, actually, they actually blew right. They had problems. Well, obviously, but come on, they were they were this and they were that and they were that. It's like oh, but like you know, you feel you gotta feel bad for them. Like you gotta just understand it. And then, and then all I'm gonna say is just like oh, boo -hoo. let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. This is serious. I know. I'm not, I'm not listening to that sh On the day of the killing, it's reported that Vex would contact a friend. And in this purported phone call, it's alleged that Vex would claim responsibility for killing and skinning a dog. When the shock friend replied in disgust, Vex reportedly replies back with, quote, If you think that's strange, I'm sitting next to a dead body. According to this friend, Vex would then go on to explain what had happened, candidly describing the killing and how they had perpetrated it in great detail. The friend that the duo had confided in would notify There's way too many dog-related incidents in this video alone. The killing, and not long after, authorities would arrive at Hector's residence. According to reports, the couple would attempt to flee using Hector's own vehicle, but they would be caught not long after and taken into custody. The abrupt killing of Hector Hernandez by these two furries is a bit confusing at first, but after the police interrogation, the story starts to come together. In a police interrogation, Jax would claim that they were using Hector as a ride to California, but at some point claims that Hector had inappropriately touched Vex. Apparently, <sighs> shut. Oof, that didn't happen, bro. Let's let's keep it a stack. I know that you know that we know that that didn't happen. Come on, bro. Like L cat. Apparently outraged by this, Jack says he saw red and just started. So you got a a a, a dumbbell, a knife, a gun, and what else? What else? And some some more and some more to, to do that. 
Facts, Mac. Like, oh, they needed all that. Beating the man. So that was Jax's excuse for killing Hector. However, Vex, on the other hand, said that it was planned out. Vex reportedly told police that the couple intentionally used Craigslist as a way to lure in a random victim with promises of sex, only to then rob them after being invited into their victim's home. According Quick tip, well, Craigslist is pretty much dead in GTA. Don't use Craigslist. According to police, Vex admitted that after killing Hernandez, the couple had plans to take the man's car and live in the wilderness. Whatever the case, both were facing a slew of murder charges. While these individuals haven't been sentenced yet, it's safe to say that they'll probably be behind bars for a long time. It's a bizarre story showcasing two of the most deranged minds in the furry fandom. Well, ladies and gentlemen, those were the world's most dangerous furries. Yeah. Good video from Wavy. Very disturbing, though. I ain't gonna lie to you. Very, very disturbing. This might this might be one of the more disturbing ones that we've watched. I ain't gonna lie to you. There's so many dog-related dreams on here. I ain't gonna hold you. If you didn't like furries before this video, you definitely not gonna like them after. Because she's just crazy, bro. Video from him. Very interesting to see how some of these people are. You know what I'm saying? But, um, yeah. Good video. BBG plug. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. That's me. That's me. Run is due. You know what I'm saying? All right, BBG. Alright.